I'm Scott Al Miller. It's the 13th of June, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua, and today I'm going to be addressing, again, what recommendations I have for those of you who want to start a business here in Nicaragua. We're going to get to that right after the bump. I get asked this with quite some frequency, whether it's in the comments or people emailing me, but what businesses would I recommend for expats and new immigrants coming to Nicaragua so they can start and, and have a business here? We're gonna get to that right after. Really quickly talking about, so I placed an order for dinner. Yesterday, on yesterday's video, I was raving about Pedido's job and being able to get food delivered and, and all this. And of course, we use it all the time and it's great. On the day that I said that yesterday, first of all, Subway messed up at two of our orders. They apparently put something on the menu and said it's tuna, but when you order it, it's actually a stacked meat thing. None of that's in the description. It just says tuna and veggies, but they mean bacon and ham. And okay, we're vegetarian, right? So two foot long subs loaded with meat that we, will, we can't eat. The kids will never touch anything that's touched that kind of meat, such a problem. So that happened twice yesterday. And then for dinner, we had this whole plan. We were gonna order from Pedito's Jaw. We were gonna get a new restaurant. We looked up in the afternoon. We did everything we should, right? Look ahead of time, be prepared, know what we wanted to get. I then had to record the parade yesterday, which you're not gonna see for several days, but I've got some really cool parade recording that you're gonna see in about five days. I'm not sure exactly when it's gonna come out. And uh, so I went and did that. And that parade went past the restaurant. So we couldn't order during the parade because it was blocked. So that was perfect. I got back from the parade. The instant I walked in the door from the parade, sat down with the girl, said, okay, is this what we want? And I placed the order and I opened up Pedito's Jaw and it was available for order because the parade had stopped. So I'm like, yes. So I went through and placed the order. By the time I clicked order, they had closed the restaurant along with everything else because it was the peak of dinner. And so Pedito's Jaw shut down delivery which they do sometimes when things get really busy, they don't have enough delivery people. So the delivery system gets turned off and they say, you know, you can still order, but you have to go pick it up. So we're like, oh great, that's a problem. So we were, had already put in our order and it wouldn't let us complete the order. And so we had to figure out that that's what happened. Then we went back into it and it was all closed. And, it was, and they're like, oh no, we just did all this. What do you want to do? And the girls really wanted to get this new food because it was it was a new restaurant and new food items. And it's such a big deal for them to pick out their food. This was a huge accomplishment that we had done it early. We had found something that everybody wanted. It was something new. We were trying new things. Luchana was ready to try uh, pasta, uh, lobster cream sauce pasta. Lisa was trying grilled vegetable pasta like I was getting a new burrito thing. It was all we were very excited. They were trying this new thing. So I asked them, what do you want to do? And they're like, let's take the risk. We're going to wait until 8.30. So every restaurant in Nicaragua closes early, right? This is just not a late food country, which is one thing. It's a strike against it. Like in general, I love most everything about Nicaragua. The early food culture kills me. I'm a, and the U.S. is the same, right? So, but there's a lot of 24-hour things in the U.S., right? Taco Bell tends to be open late. There's always something. Um, I'm a Mediterranean eater, right? I like Mediterranean food and I like it late at night. I would like to sit down at about eight to nine o'clock at night for dinner. And I would like it to take an hour or two and have a glass of wine and have biscotti at the end and dunk that in more wine. And that's how I like it. And then go for a walk. I love the passeggiata and all those things and schedule of Italian and Spanish life. It's not how it is here. Everything is closed by 930. Most things are closed earlier, but the late night places, the pizza places, they're 930. So this particular restaurant was going till 930. We said, we're going to give them till 830. If they're not reopened at 830, we're going to go with a different service or a different restaurant and order before there's no choices. So we waited and we waited. And I, every 10 minutes, I would check to see if they had opened the restaurant for delivery again. And they did at about 8.20 at the very last second before we decided to do something else. I ordered immediately. I knew exactly what we wanted. Boom, 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 just in case they closed again. So we ordered the instant they opened the restaurant for delivery again. I placed the order. It was accepted. I paid. 
good. It said, yep, the restaurant has accepted your order. The restaurant's preparing your order. Everything was good. We waited 70 minutes. It was 927. So we ordered at about 820 at 927, three minutes left before everything closes in town. I hear a car outside. I look at the phone. It buzzes. I'm like, okay, that's them telling me they had arrived. Luciana had been in my office just two minutes before. She said, when's our food getting here? And I said, well, it shows delivery between 9... 15 and 9.33, so the map shows they're still at the restaurant, but they're supposed to be here within the next 10 minutes or so, so they're probably just about done. Like, they have, like, all this stuff to know when they're coming. I'm like, oh, then it, so just a couple minutes later, I'm like, oh, I must have missed them coming down the street. They're already here. Maybe the map didn't pick them up, and I ran out, and I just realized that my microphone is across the room, so I'm really hoping that the audio was decent enough on all of that, or I'm going to have to redo it. And so I go outside, and I look at the phone, and at 9.27, three minutes before every restaurant, literally, there's no delivery after 9.30. None. There's no restaurant that lists later than that. There's something open in town if you drive around, but there is no way to get delivery past that point, which, again, that's a big negative. I really wish I could order at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, because that's a lot of time when we're hungry. And so with three minutes to go, they canceled the order. They had already taken our money. They had already said they were preparing it over an hour before. It was supposed to be pulling up to our door as much as 10 minutes before. And that's when they chose to cancel it. You've got to be kidding me. They clearly had a kitchen staff who got to the end of the day and said, we don't feel like doing any orders today and just canceled them. And they must have canceled them all because we were sitting on the button to order the moment they opened. So we were the first order, I'm sure, maybe the second of the evening, and we didn't get our food and they canceled at the point they closed. We couldn't replace the order because they were closed. It was so ridiculous. Luckily, I had thought this through and knew what to do, and I was ready to hit the button and we got Pizza Hut and I'm currently recording this while we're waiting for Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut was closing in three minutes, but they accepted the order. I'm pretty confident that they're actually going to deliver, and they say it's going to arrive sometime around 10.30. So we have to wait another hour before we find out if that arrives. But if that doesn't arrive, it doesn't matter. The grocery stores are closed. The convenience stores are closing. There's nowhere to order from. We've just got the food that's in the house. So uh, if that doesn't come, we are uh, completely out of luck. But that was my rant about our evening of trying to get food. All right, and on to, the, to today's actual topic. What kind of businesses do I recommend for expats? This, I have, I've done a number of recordings on this, and I know people don't necessarily watch all of them, um, and I think a lot of people simply don't believe this, because I've said this to, people, to, to a lot of people in person, and they simply can't get it, or they don't agree with me, right? Maybe that's the thing, but um, the fact that people always come back with, but, 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 tells me that they're not getting what I'm saying rather than disagreeing with me. Uh, but here's the basics of business. Remember, I've owned my own companies for more than, more than a quarter of a century. I've been a business consultant for most of my adult life. I've worked with businesses of all kinds, all sizes, everywhere in the world. This is, I am a business person. Business is what I do. I love business. It's really interesting. It's fun. It's challenging. It's exciting. And it's my field. So I really, really am into business. I did not come to Nicaragua to be in business. This is important. I came to Nicaragua because it makes sense in my big picture, right? I am an American businessman simply because I'm from America. So when we're in business and you're looking anywhere, this is generic, has nothing to do with Nicaragua. When you're looking at starting a business, there's a few rules that we generally say, because I, I talk to a lot of people who are interested in being business people and they have these similar questions. They could be Americans, it could be Canadians, whatever. And they say, in, in not moving, not like, you know, I really want to uh, do this thing. I want to have a business. I want to, how do I do it? What do you recommend? And the answer is always the same. There's do you, you know, magically own a location that gives you a business, a location business, as we call it, a business that makes sense because you own a location? Could also be called a real estate business, but that means something else generally. So like McDonald's or Starbucks, they're famous for buying a spot that's perfect for breakfast or coffee. And when they own that spot, then they put in a business that people recognize and people don't necessarily want to go to Starbucks or McDonald's, but it's in the right spot. So they do. It's a good business model. That's something that they do. They do a lot of research and do a lot of investment to buy those spots. So you can have a location business pretty much anywhere, and that can make sense. Do you inherit a business? Are you really good at something that you know how to do and other people don't? Then do that thing, potentially. Is that a business? Um, or do you see a gap in a market where you can fill it and someone else can't? Great. That could be you. Some, one of these things 
you need, but you have to have advantages. What are you bringing to the table? Who's going to compete with you? Uh, where you, you have to have an advantage. Businesses are hard. The average business fails. The average good business fails, right? If you have a good business, you're like, I'm, I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to put in the effort. I'm going to invest. I don't have all these negatives. What are my chances of success? And the answer is low. It's not impossible. People do it all the time. But people fail far more often, even when they have the cards stacked in their favor. Business is hard. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be called investing, right? It wouldn't be risky. You would just do it and magically make money and everybody would do it. People don't do it. The reason that people don't go out and say, I'm just going to start a business. I don't need to work for people. I'm going to start a business. It's because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of risk. And most people don't want to put in that much work or take that much risk for good reasons, right? Like this is, I have a bug on my glasses. <sighs> There's good reasons why the average person doesn't want to do this stuff. <sighs> Seriously, that bug was like, new. No, I'm getting on the show. It's a big show. I'm going to be there. Um, so this is hard. And that's hard in America. And I've said this on many episodes. America is one of the easiest places in the world to have a successful business. Nicaragua is one of the hardest. The United States is one of the largest economies in the world. Nicaragua is one of the smallest. Certainly not the smallest, but very small. It's on the very small side of things. Anything you could do in the US, Canada, Western Europe is going to be astronomically harder in Nicaragua because the economy is not there, because it doesn't have the business environment to make it easy. So if you have the opportunity, this is a general rule, if you have the ability to open a business somewhere, don't do it in Nicaragua. It does not count as a location that is itself beneficial. If you were Nicaraguan and you had an opportunity to open a business in the United States, that would be a different discussion, right? Because that is, you're coming from a place where opening a business is extremely hard and risky to a place where it's at least much easier and less risky. It is still hard and risky, but not as hard and risky. Nicaragua is, is the pro level. The U.S. is the starter level. If you would, if I said to you, why don't you go open a restaurant in the United States? Why don't you go start a coffee shop in the United States? Why don't you go open a hotel in the United States? Why don't you go start a consulting business in the United States? And you go, but I don't know, I'm worried. Nope, stop right there. If you hesitate at it, you're not prepared to do it in Nicaragua because this is the hard level. If this was a video game, this is the hardness cranked most of the way up. Maybe not the absolute most. There are environments that are much less friendly than this because Nicaragua is at least business friendly. Right, It has a good legal structure, better than the U.S. actually. It has good protections for most things. It is very welcoming to people who want to invest. It gives you good reasons to want to invest beyond just making money. Great. So it's certainly not the worst, but it is on the hard side. The economy is so small, and there are so many people here already looking for business because every expat asks the exact same thing. So you're not coming into a greenfield where it's like, well, no one's doing any of this, so I have an opportunity because there's no competition. It is exactly the opposite. The competition is so ridiculously over the top that there are more Americans per capita trying to invest and start businesses in Nicaragua than there are in the United States per capita, right? This is an extremely highly competitive, difficult environment in every way you could possibly imagine. So if you're not already doing it in the US, you're not already doing it in Western Europe, wherever you're coming from, it shouldn't even be on the table to talk about it here, right? That's the first thing. You should be experienced and have, have gotten your, your experiences somewhere easy before you try it here. If you're Nicaraguan, you don't have that choice normally, so whatever. But if you're coming from somewhere and you, you have that opportunity to make your money somewhere else, do it. If you have that opportunity to get your experience somewhere else, do it. If that experience gives you something that says, wow, now I can do the same thing in Nicaragua or similar in Nicaragua and it's going to be wildly successful and I know why, great. If you have anything like that, you won't be asking me what could I do to invest in Nicaragua. If you have to ask that question, stop and say there's no chance that I can be asking this question and have the expertise necessary to be successful. The two really can't go together. Every person who is going to be successful in Nicaragua is going to show up knowing I've got this expertise, I have this reason that people can't compete with me, I have this unique thing, I have it, and now I can do it in Nicaragua. I could also do it in Honduras, I could also do it in Costa Rica, I could also do it in America, but I'm going to do it in Nicaragua because Nicaragua is really lacking in that thing, or there's less competition, or the, the cost is lower, and I'm going to export something. Great. You would already know that. You would never need to ask someone what kind of business to go in. 
If you're asking that question, that means you're guessing, right? You're asking for the, the really big expertise of what business is going to make money. You're asking that of me. And while I would love to be able to provide that information to people, that's not a particular problem. There's things you have to realize is that one, no person but you will ever actually have that information because it's unique to you. So if you can't answer it, anything I say is not going to be good for you. Second is anything I would say if I believed in it, because I have the ability to invest myself. I have access to other investors. I'm already in the Nicaragua market. I have huge advantages over anyone who isn't here yet. I have huge advantages over most of the people who are here. I already have Nicaraguans who work for me. I already have established companies here. I can spin up a new idea before you can run it past your own decision makers. If you're like, I have this idea. I want to start a paper mill and, and I, I, it's going to be cool. And I'm going to do it. By the time you start, finish that conversation, if I believed that that was actually a smart investment, I'd already have that company up and running. And you'd be like, all right, I'm ready to talk to people about, oh, it's already been done. And the competent, I'd be first in the market. So if I believed in it, it's too late by the time you've asked me. Right? The reason I haven't done whatever it is I might tell you is because I don't think it's a good idea. One of the things that's really important to understand is people look at businesses that are here and say, those businesses are doing okay. Why can't I have the same success? Now, I've talked about this before. Most of the businesses you see are not making money of the people who own businesses. For example, I have a hotel on the beach and you say, wow, there's lots of hotels on the beach. They must all be making money. These are businesses that have been around a long time. They are still closing left and right. Those who are still open are desperately hanging on. Uh, many of them are for sale at fire sale prices and no one's buying them, not because there isn't money. As someone said on the channel recently, there's notably a lot more money in Nicaragua than there has been in the past. And people are not buying these businesses with that money for a reason. There's still no money to be made in most cases. And those who know the market best and those with the most resources to make a difference in the market are avoiding those investments. If the local Nicaraguans are not willing to invest in it or the Nicaraguans who've moved away and have access to American or Canadian funds and know the market are not investing in it, then why would you want to invest in it? Because you're at a massive disadvantage to those people. If it's not good enough for them, it's not even close to good enough for you. So in many cases, you're looking at businesses that are not doing well. And it just seems like because they exist that they must be doing okay. And it doesn't mean that. Now, there are businesses here that make some money. And there are some that are owned by expats. And it is possible to have a business here as an expat and make money. It is extremely difficult. It is a one in a thousand chance compared to the United States. So if it's rough in the United States, it is so much more rough here. And those that have done okay, such as, and I'll name him, our friend Dave, who owns Playa Roca out on the beach, one of the reasons he's done okay is that he has spent decades building up a clientele, decades building up a reputation, and he paid the place off in cash decades ago. So he got in when there was no competition or extremely little, he got in when he offered something unique, an American owned uh, sports bar, big beach space, lots of, he has a lot of checkbox that he had a unique location. So he had location, location, location. That was the first thing. Do you, if you're just guessing right now, no, you don't. He had the location, he was first in the market, he was in a spot that had very little competition and wasn't likely to have competition for a really, really long time. And he developed the market decades ago when things weren't existing in Nicaragua and paid everything off when it was really cheap. If you think it's cheap now, it was so cheap back then and has now has this great reputation. Everything is paid for and it's still horrible for him on the beach because there just isn't a big enough market for that to be successful. He can hold on because he has no bills, because he has no marketing to do. All those things are covered, so all he has to do is keep the lights on. But that's the mode people are in. If they've already done all the investment, they can now try to keep the lights on. And continuously, we see people unable to keep the lights on. So that's a, a constant failing thing. Now, someone said that, that they want to look in Managua because, oh, there's got to be opportunities beyond all these 
businesses that we constantly hear from expats. Expats have hotels and restaurants and coffee shops and all these things, but there's a reason why they do. And it's taken me a while to think about it, but my own example is a good one. Why do I own a business and why do I constantly warn people about having businesses when I have one myself? So there's a couple things to remember. One is I don't have a business. I have a hobby that is legally classified as a business. I don't expect it to make money. It is not here to make money. I didn't invest in it to make money. I, in, I bought a house and it turned out to be a working hotel and we felt like we didn't want to lay people off and it was neat having our own restaurant so we kept it going at great expense to ourselves. It is not a smart financial move in any way whatsoever but it was something that met a lot of our needs and so we're happy that we did it but we didn't do it to make money and we have not made money. We are one of those people who got in when it was ultra cheap. We got in and got a big name, didn't have to do a lot of marketing, have an amazing location. With all of that, I can tell you, if you're thinking of it as a business, you're not thinking like a business person, right? You, that's not how business people think. Business people think, how can I make money? Not, how can I run something called a business in Nicaragua at any cost? Right, and that's when you say, well, I want a business and I want to be in Managua so I can have a business. No, when you're saying those things, you're not approaching your business startup like a business person. You're approaching it like a hobbyist. Now, I am a hobbyist. I run businesses because it's fun. I like having a hotel. I like having a restaurant. I like having a place that does coffee and I like a place that serves drinks. I like being a live music venue. I like those things. I don't do them because they make money, because they don't. I do them because they're fun to be an owner of those things so I can go to my own place and have control of that venue. It is a hobby, not a business. That's a very important differentiation. The reason that you see so many expats doing hotels and restaurants and coffee shops and similar is because they are not businesses. They are not here to make money. They didn't do any business planning. They said, what is fun for me or what is going to provide a service I want? And that was another aspect of us having a hotel and restaurant. We want to be able to stay on the beach anytime we want. We own a hotel. We get to do that. We want to have certain foods that are available to us when we're on the beach. We own a restaurant. We can do that. It is a hobby. It has served to offset the cost of having access to the food we want. It has made having a place on the beach more cost effective than just owning a house, but that's about it. It has offset its own cost. It has not generated money. So the reasons that make it a hobby really do make sense, but you need to be very careful. The reason that so many people come to Nicaragua and have a business and aren't upset about it is because it's not a business, it's a hobby and it is someone who has the money that they can throw away, and of course they don't want to lose money, and in some cases they actually do make money, but generally extremely little, and nothing worth the effort. If they were trying to make money, if that was their goal, they would never have done it in Nicaragua. If you go talk to any of these successful hotels and say, was this the way to make money? No, they, every single one of them would tell you the same thing. If I took the same money and invested it somewhere else, I could have made more. Now, some of us do investment also because they want residency and the investment residency is better than the retirement residency for most people anyway. And that's fine. Again, that's not a business business. That is a legal business that you are doing to buy residency with minimal losses. Great. All of that's fine. And if that's what you're trying to do, excellent. But you have to step back and say, this is a hobby. And the question needs to be, what are you going to enjoy losing your money on? not what is a good business. And no, so even more so than what's your expertise, what advantages do you have, you need to answer, what do I enjoy doing? I would love running an, a, a Persian rug store. Okay, then that's the thing you should do. Are you gonna lose money? Absolutely. Are you gonna sell some rugs? Maybe never, right? Are you gonna sell a few though? Probably, but you'll get to own at moderate loss, a showroom for Persian rugs. And if that's what makes you happy, make yourself happy. That's what hobbies are for. Make yourself happy. But don't think of it as a business. Don't ask people for business advice because the only advice that makes sense is don't do it, right? Do not go down this path. The only people for whom this path makes sense are people who are uh, already savvy, already have the expertise, and are bringing something unique to the table that they know is unique, that they know is not able to be replicated, that they know it has a really high chance of filling a need without someone else being able to be a competitor. And that's another piece you have to understand. 
if you identify, wow, they don't have a Persian rug store here, and I could fill that gap, and I don't mind investing in Persian rugs, the question then becomes, okay, maybe that's true. I don't know how no one thought of it. I don't know how the people who live here are, you know, if, if that was truly a market, someone would have tested it. Someone who already owns a store and doesn't need to start a business just for that. Someone who has access to Persian rugs directly. Someone who already has connections in Nicaragua and can do it for basically no overhead. Someone would have done it. But let's say somehow there's actually a gap and you're the first one. The problem is if you don't have a real specific expertise, you don't have a unique lock on Persian rug importing, you don't have a special knowledge of, of Persian rugs that no one else can replicate, you don't have right, the right connections to get lower cost rugs, if you're just a normal person trying to bring in rugs, you are not only lacking in advantages, you are naturally at a massive, and I can't stress this enough, an unthinkably large disadvantage compared to the Nicaraguans who are already here because they have access to lower cost labor, easier times with taxes and accountants and lawyers and all those things, all the little things that will be really hard for you will not even show up on their radar as things. They'll just breeze right through it. Even if you open that Persian rug store and you're the first one and you are NicaraguaPersianRugs.com and everybody learns about Persian rugs from you, two or three Nicaraguans are going to call someone in America, call someone in Canada and say, I need X amount of dollars to have more inventory. This guy proved Persian rugs can work. I can cut the labor costs in half. Let's get some Persian rugs and own this market and they will destroy you overnight. If you have a viable business but have nothing making you unique, nothing making you unstoppable, you will be stopped because this is not your market. Right? And the same thing happens in America. I've taught this to people who are going to start a business. I said, wait, here are the people that you're making your money on. They're going to go out and make the money instead of you. They're going to take a lower profit. They're going to go direct to your competitors. And that's going to be it. And you're going to lose your business just like that. You're going to show that there's a business in if it's viable, which was not likely. But if it was viable, here's how you'll lose it instantly. And it's, it's basically guaranteed. There's nothing to protect your business because there's no expertise involved. And if that applies in America, imagine how much more it applies here, where locals are not going to want to spend extra money, right? It's a tight market. They're definitely not going to want to buy from expats when they can buy from locals. Everything is in not your favor, right? Everything's working against you. So my most important advice, I cannot possibly stress this enough, is don't come to Nicaragua looking for business opportunities. That should never cross your mind. Nobody should come here looking for opportunities. If you're coming here because you were given an opportunity, if you're coming here because you already identified something and Nicaragua ended up being the best place to do it, great, you're massively the minority and you're not asking me or anyone else for advice in that nature. You might be asking me advice like, who's the best lawyer to use for this? Who, what city would be good to do this in? And maybe I have some expertise there, maybe, that could help you. That's possible. But the actual business stuff, you would already know more than anybody could help you if you were going to be successful. The people who have done it, right? The people who've come and opened big factories and done cool things, they either own a lock on the market. So here in Leon, who has the biggest outside businesses? Well, big uh, like muffler or, or uh, uh, transmission manufacturing companies. Wow, well, there must be a huge opportunity. Maybe we should start right a transmission company. No. They're subsidiaries of the company of their own client. There's no possibility if we opened a transmission company and built transmissions just as good as them and sold them for just a little bit less, no one would buy them because they're making them for themselves. There's no competition. That's why they're wildly successful and able to have these big businesses. If you're trying to compete, you got to have that unique advantage. They have it because it's them, right? So that's where everyone's failing. Right? We never hear stories of expats who come here and are wildly successful because they, they looked for business opportunity. Never. I've never once heard that story. I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm saying I've never heard it. No one talks about it. No one thinks that it could happen. None of us who are here, none of the business people, none of the non-business people have approached it from a how do I start a business perspective. We all start it from a I want to live in Nicaragua and sometimes owning a business facilitates part of that. Some of it fills a need that we needed, whatever, not 
it's a business and I'm trying to make money. That's the thing that's insurmountable for all intents and purposes. Another reason that you tend to see the same types of businesses repeated again and again for expats is because the one spot where expats having a business have a unique advantage over Nicaraguans is in understanding what other expats are looking for, or more importantly, fulfilling a gap that they themselves have encountered. So if you go naturally to a new beach where there's not very much construction, let's take Salinas Grandes, for example, that is the nearly empty beach just south of Las Panitas. It doesn't even have a paved road yet. So if you go there, you go, wow, this is a basically empty beach. There's nothing going on. There's no restaurants for me to go to, no hotel to stay at. It's just a few houses. And while it's a lovely spot, why would I go there? There's no infrastructure. So it is natural that at some point an expat is going to move there and say, well, there's actually a Commodore and the Commodore, and that's where the locals eat in the, in the fishing village. They're not looking for more food under normal circumstances. And when they do, they'll go into Leon, not that far. Uh, but they're not looking for different food on a regular basis. And if you as an expat think that you have an answer to Nicaraguan food for Nicaraguans, I can tell you, you're wrong. You do not. Every expat thinks that they have some food that Nicaraguans are going to just die to get their hands on, and they're always wrong. In some cases, Nicaraguans will eat it, but in general, they're going to eat it in very small quantities and go right back to eating what they always ate, which for thousands of years has been the food that makes sense, and it's what they're used to. Right? Coming from America, we're used to variety, and coming from Nicaragua, they're used to not variety in their cuisine. The quality is very high, but the variety is low, whereas in America, the quality is mediocre and the variety is extremely high. So we have very different approaches, very different cultural backgrounds, very different experiences when it comes to food. And Nicaraguans really don't understand how to make expats happy. But also, if they did, they probably wouldn't care because there's not very much money in it. It's not a very good business plan under normal circumstances. But if you're an expat and you're moving to Salinas Grandes and you know other expats are moving to Salinas Grandes, you know a couple things. You know that you have a captive audience. They have no other restaurant to go to. And you know that you want to eat your food because you are missing those food items because you can't get it anywhere else. So you know that you're going to use it. You're going to fulfill a need for yourself. You don't need to make money because you're not a business person. You're doing the natural thing to fulfill a gap in your market. And because you're an expat and first to market, you actually do have a competitive advantage because the Nicaraguans do not have the same expertise that you do because you're not servicing Nicaraguans, you're ser servicing expats. Now, if they want to open a restaurant to service Nicaraguans, you're at a disadvantage. But as long as expats are your business, you have a very slight advantage in some areas and definitely a lot of disadvantages in others, but it's enough that it could make sense. And if you're the first to market in a market where there's not enough space for a competitor, you may manage to shut someone out or hold off long enough until the market gets bigger and then people move into it. So there are times where it can function, but there is a reason why you're seeing coffee shops and restaurants and hotels repeating. It's because it's people fulfilling a need that they have and replicating a known model that minimizes loss, often provides residency, can, if you do a really good job, make a small amount of money, and allows you to do so by leveraging the fact that you're an expat and allowing you to purchase a location that may give you a somewhat unique advantage. For example, a restaurant that is on the estuary corner in Las Panitas would be unique. There is one there and no one else can have that corner. And so what little business it gets is partially because of its location. Since they invested in that long ago, they hold on to it and it keeps them unique. And there's always going to be someone eating there because it has this 90 degree corner view of the estuary and the ocean. And it's just, it's kind of nice. So they have a lock because of the location, but they're always being uh, challenged by people who are almost as good as view, right? Just a little bit down the beach, a hundred feet, a new place opens up. Well, you know, people, if they have better food, people may go there even though the view isn't quite as good, but that location gives them that location piece that you can make a business case for and that's if you're going to go to Salinas Grande, so you could get a really great spot on the beach in theory, put in a restaurant there, be the first one there, and probably need to hold out for a decade before it grew to the point where it actually could make you money. But if you were the only one for a decade, you probably could minimize your losses. And then for a while, you'd probably have no competition and be big enough to make a little bit of money possibly make it profitable, and then eventually the market would grow and, and you'd be back to just competing like a no normal restaurant, in which case you may be able to make money. But that leads us to 
The other thing, when you're looking at business, this is a general business rule, again, is that you don't just look at the absolutes. Can this make money? And that's a mistake that newbies in the business will often do. So we'll look at, uh, let's, let's take that Salinas Grande's restaurant and say, wow, this restaurant made $5,000 last year, profit right? $5,000. That's $5,000 I didn't have before. Therefore, it was good. It made money. Yes, it made money from a legal taxable standpoint. You will need to pay taxes on $5,000. True. But that is not how business people define making money. That would be losing money. Because to make that $5,000, you probably invested, let's say, about $100,000, maybe $300,000. But just to keep the math simple, we're going to say $100,000. You bought a plot of land. You built a, a rancho. You got a kitchen up and running. You did a little bit of advertising. You hired a few people. You put in uh, the fryers and the grill and all that stuff. And for $100,000, you're up and running. You have a small restaurant servicing expats on the beach, Salinas Grandes. Cool, what a great way to spend $100,000 if it's a hobby. That's, if that makes you $5,000 throughout the year, one, that would be a miracle. But if it did, great, good for you, great job. You did something unique. You really did service a market. That's fantastic. However, someone who knows business will say, wait a minute, that only made half the expected profit of an index fund investment and did so at really high risk. The index fund has a very low risk. It's basically guaranteed to average out around 9 or 10% over time. Your restaurant got lucky and hit 5%, and that's before you paid taxes on it. The, the index fund also is before taxes, but it sometimes has an advantage. Let's just say they're the same. You're making roughly half the money, but it's in a year we consider a lucky one, not an average one. If you manage to average $10,000 profit on a $100,000 investment and don't have to reinvest, then you'd be potentially matching just an index fund. That's the baseline that businesses use to say, this is what doing no work, having no effort, no expertise, that's how much money money makes when there's nothing behind it, right? Roughly 10% per year. So if you have a business and it is making under 10% per year, that means that you're not making anything for your labor. You are not making profits, not real profits. Your money is losing money compared to doing nothing. The reason that people invest in their own businesses is because they hope that through their expertise, their good planning, their business sense, maybe getting lucky, that they will significantly, not 1%, but significantly by like 10 or 20% beat that baseline of an index fund. And that's really hard to do. When we say most businesses fail, we mean 85% of them go out of business in the U.S. Imagine how many go out of business in Nicaragua, much higher than 85% uh, before they, they really get their feet under them. And then how many of them that survive, actually survive and beat that index fund number versus just keeping from going out of business and people don't close them because of the sunk cost, because they've already put in so much money, they've already put in so much time, they're hoping that they can at least recoup something that they've put in and lost all that time. It's essentially nothing is actually successful as a business. It's important to understand that that context before you even begin starting. Now, Again, if you're doing it because you want the business, it's just fun, you need the residency, you need the whatever, it's a completely different discussion. This is not the warning for you. There are warnings for those people, but they're very different. They're how to hedge so that you're not risking the investment that you're making. Great. But for people who are saying, how do I start a business? Because for some reason, and I say this every time this comes up, for some reason, expats moving to Nicaragua, not to most countries, but to Nicaragua seem to be universally obsessed, and I truly mean obsessed, uh, an irrational, massive desire to start a business and buy homes with making decisions about it before they live here and have any of the expertise that would be necessary to even consider it. It's the combination of why does anyone want to start a business in Nicaragua? What, what made you come to that decision? Like, there's got to be something wrong to have that feeling in the first place. What, what triggered that? And the second is why do you want to do it so early when you haven't done the market research? No one can do that for you. I mean, I can do a lot, but it's all going to end up, I can tell you right now, it's all going to end up in warnings. You can come to me and say, look, I got this great business idea. Here's what it is. And this is what I do professionally. 
in the US. So it's reasonable to come to me with these things and somebody sometime will have a good idea, but it will still come with loads of caveats, right? Here's where your risks are gonna be. Here's the things you're not thinking about. Here's the, the blind sides. You come in and say, look, I've got this unique thing. I've got this expertise. I've got this opportunity. I know this guy, I've got a lock on this market. What do you think? Great, put me under a, a non-disclosure and we can sit down and, it, and, and if you think you have something that's actually, if you actually believe you have something good, you need to have me under an NDR before you talk to me. Not that I'm the riskiest person, but obviously if you give me a great idea and don't give me an NDR, I'm going to have this struggle of, but I know a great business idea and, I, and why am I not doing it? Other people must know this, right? Like put me under NDR, put anyone under an NDR, tell them the idea and get that feedback for sure. Right, that's not a problem. But I can tell you right now, all these things are going to come up. You're not unique. If you are, you know you are, right? You don't have to ask anybody. Um, so those are the things to really consider. There's essentially no chance that as an expat, that a business, as a business in Nicaragua has the slightest chance of making sense. If it's, you're doing it here because you're obsessed with being in a, in a business that you run every day, and you know that Nicaragua is where you want to live. And you don't care about your profits. You don't care about the business aspects of making money. You just care that you want a place where you can work. And this is what's going to allow you to do the job you want to do. And Nicaragua is where you want to do it. That's fine. That's great. But that's a hobby. And you don't need to ask me about it. Right? Go find the place you want to live. Start the business you want to work at. Lose however much money you're okay losing. Like, you don't need advice for that. Um, so that's that's the warning. That's the thing that people really need to understand. And the biggest takeaway, I guarantee, is you are not the exception. And America teaches us this. They teach us to believe we're always the exception to every rule. But everyone is not the exception to every rule. That's what makes it the rule. And the more you think you're an exception, the more likely you are not to be. Right? The people who are like, I, I can't be an exception. This rule must apply to me. They're the most likely to actually be an exception, as unlikely as it still is. Those things do exist, but the people who are the actual exception will naturally not think that they are. Right? So really take to heart. Every single person, not really, but nearly every person that I talk to who's looking at moving gives me the same set of things. Oh, but I, I got to have a business. Why? And they can't give me a reason. They're just, it, it, it's an OCD, right? Uh, well, but I have to make money in Nicaragua. Why? No one else does. Why do you need to? Right? Well, oh, right. The, make your money somewhere else. Spend your money in Nicaragua. Few people, very few, including Nicaraguans, love Nicaragua as much as I do. And very few take the effort to get the news out there and tell people about it and, and spread the passion of the Nicaraguan experience with other people than me. And I'm telling you, from a business perspective, as a business advisor who advises really large companies in the United States and really small ones, and has done this for a really long time, and has worked in some really demanding environments, and has businesses in Nicaragua, it does not make sense in the way that you're, you're thinking. It just doesn't stop and say, I'm not the exception. I'm, I need to follow the rules of business. I need to follow the rules of expatting in Nicaragua. And all of them say, don't start a business here unless it's a hobby, unless it's for a residency, unless it solves a very specific need, and then your thought is hedge, not profit. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to support this channel and help me be a successful business as much as I can be. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. And if you'd like to actually hire us and put me under NDR or not, uh, if you're looking for just housing advice or where you'd like to live or what it takes to move, uh, that's normal. If you do have a business plan and you truly want to hire me as a business consultant, I'm going to tell you right now, simply don't do the business, save yourself the money. But if you really want me to sit down and, and shake some sense into you, put me under an NDR. Same thing, info at relocatenicaragua.com. You can reach me there. My team will help you out. As always, share on social media. Tell your friends. Post this on the Twitter, on the Reddit groups. Let people know there's information about Nicaragua out there. It's business. It's relocation. It's all kinds of things. Get the word out because people don't know about Nicaragua and they need to. And not just here, other places. But this is a good starting point to open your eyes with Wow, there's a lot out there I didn't know. I will see all of you tomorrow.